Well, hello. It's good to be back with you again for another broadcast from the Mount Forest House Church, the Church of God in Mount Forest. I want to share with you this evening uh, just the last part of the first book in the New Testament of our Bibles, the Gospel by Matthew. Matthew ends his account of the good news about Jesus Christ uh, with the words that we're going to uh, read together in just a moment. Quite significant, really. It isn't the end of the story, but it's the end of Matthew's account as far as he got with it. He's going to describe an occasion when the 11 remaining disciples who had been faithful to the Lord Jesus were called by Jesus to meet him on a mountaintop. And it was a mountain in Galilee to the north of Jerusalem. And they had dutifully gone there in accordance with his instructions. He had met them on the mountain and now he was going to give them a responsibility. He was going to tell them that he was going to be leaving them, but they were to serve him as they stayed behind, at least for the time being. Eleven men that are mentioned here. There had been twelve. The twelve included Judas Iscariot, and Judas was the one who, even though he responded to the call of the Lord Jesus, to become a disciple, a follower of Jesus. He turned out to be a traitor. So that left the 11 others. Uh, some of them had more confidence about their position than others. All of them were scared after Jesus had died. They'd, they'd watched that event. They knew that it wasn't just a natural death, it was a crucifixion. He had been put to death on a cross outside the city of Jerusalem. And it was an awful, gory scene, and there was no doubt that he had died. And then, to their great surprise, even though he had told them repeatedly that this would happen, on the third day after his crucifixion, he arose from the dead. And they couldn't believe their eyes. They couldn't believe their ears when others told, it, told them about it. And they couldn't believe, believe their eyes when they saw it. And he had to say, give me something to eat. Let me prove to you that I really am here. I have a body that can still con consume food. I'm not just a ghost. Uh, what sort of ghost has the ability to eat and drink before you? And so they had been surprised by that first meeting with him as he was raised from the dead, alive again. And it proved all the things that he had told them were true, that even though people would intend to kill him and deal finally with him, they couldn't. The perfect man had become the perfect sacrifice to his God and Father and Jesus was raised from the dead because he had been innocent all along and that he went sinless to bear the sinner's punishment for the things like people like you and me sinners had done. And so these disciples, the eleven, saw what had happened but could hardly believe it. On that first occasion when he met with them, one of them was missing. You remember, his name was Thomas. You probably know the, uh, the Bible account. And even today there are people that are familiar with the expression doubting Thomas, because Thomas hadn't been there when the other disciples got to see the Lord Jesus after he was raised from the dead. And he says, I'll never believe it unless I, I, can, I can see it with my eyes and I can even put my hand into the marks of the, the, the scars where he was cruelly treated, treated because he'd been pinned to that cross with nails and he would bear the imprint. And then Thomas knew that a soldier had pierced his side with a spear. So he said, unless I can put my hand and touch that, I'm not going to believe that he's alive from the dead. I don't think it's because Thomas didn't want to believe, but it was just too much for him at the time. And out of all the grace and kindness of God, Jesus came back a week later when Thomas was in the same room with the others and he met with those 11 disciples and he calls Thomas to him and he says, see my hands and my feet. Reach out your hand and put it to my side. Don't be doubting but be believing. And he said, blessed are those who even without seeing believe. So Thomas, we call him Doubting Thomas. But you and I can possibly understand quite well why he would have had those doubts and the need for him to see Jesus alive from the dead, not just to believe it because somebody else told him. 
But then you get this account that we're going to read together now. And there's still some doubt is around. Let's read it. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, and it starts at verse 16. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So that's our text. And he calls the eleven to him. And it says that when they saw him, they, they worshipped him. You know what that means? It means they fell down on their faces. That's the, the meaning of the word. They were absolutely awed by the fact that he was there alive before them. And he had proved himself to be who he said he was. The son of God from heaven. No other person had been raised from the dead like that. And those who fell down and worshipped no doubt recognised who he was. But some, it says, doubted. I wonder what they doubted. I think, first of all, they doubted themselves. It's a bit like sort of saying, you know, I'm going to have to pinch myself. Is this really real? And so they didn't fall down and worship. Not at first, anyway. But they doubted themselves. There's a certain amount of self-doubt in it. I wonder if you and I are a little bit like that sometimes. We know what God has done. The facts are self-evident to us. And yet there's just something in us that's saying, it just can't be true, can it? It can't be true. So we're like that, aren't we? We get some new information. We have to fit it in with everything else that we already know and trust. And we're susceptible to doubting, even when the things are relatively straightforward, if it's a bit new and different. Imagine what it was like for these disciples. They're called to go to this mountain, and there's Jesus again, alive and well. He appears to them. They're down on their knees, and they're recognizing this is no ordinary man. I don't suppose there were crowds that were around there. I suppose the eleven would be more or less just by themselves with the Lord Jesus. And in the quietness of the mountain scene, he discloses himself to them as the Son of God from heaven with all the power of the God of eternity and the God of creation. And here's Jesus, and he's not of this world. He's God himself, the God who's outside of the universe, the great creator God. And now he has become a man. And now as a man he has died, because only as a man could he die. And he's died not because he did something wrong or because he had an accident. He's died intentionally. At the hands of men, that's true, but in the plan of God, too. So that a holy God, a God who made everything to be perfect and sees the imperfection in it now because of our wrongdoing and needs to correct all of that and punish the wrongdoing, could take all of the punishment that's due and place it on the perfect man. And Jesus bore it. It says that while he was being crucified, God put upon him all of the wrongdoing of us all and punished him for it and because he's been punished he can offer us a free pardon and no doubt he would have covered that when he was talking to these disciples because he left them with a command didn't he now you get out there and you tell everybody else what i've told you you give them the good news go and preach the gospel make disciples of them help them to understand who i really am where i've come from where i've going i'm going back to why they should live as a a group of people on earth that are different from everybody else because they're believers in Jesus Christ. They weren't called Christians at this time. They, they came to be called that later. Some doubted. I wonder how long they doubted for when they heard the words of the Master. And I wonder what it was like when he left them. He told them to go into the, all the world and he says, and I'll be with, with you to the end of the age. That's a little expression that literally means every day every hour of every day all of the time and that was his promise to them i wonder if they were still doubting when he left you know this wasn't the last occasion that they saw him 
if you go into the Gospel by Luke, and then if you go into the, the other book that Luke wrote, the book of Acts, you'll find that finally he met them again, this time nearer to Jerusalem. And having called them to that mount, the Mount of Olives, having said goodbye to them, he ascended and returned to heaven. In other words, he didn't go to Mars or Saturn. He didn't go to some other place in the physical universe. He went back to the spiritual realm where he had come from before he became a man. And now as a man, he's in heaven and he's not forgotten about us. He says, I'll be with you always. He's in heaven, but he's still able to be present with us on earth in a very special way. He said that if he goes away, he wouldn't leave us without a comforter. He would send another comforter, someone just like him, to be with you forever. And that is what the Holy Spirit is doing in human lives today, lives like yours and mine. Does he come silently? Does he come with all the immense power of God because the Holy Spirit is God too? Does he come with that great power, but without fanfare into your life and mine and empower us so that we won't be those that doubt, but be those that put into practice the things that Jesus has told us to do. So perhaps as you're just listening to this broadcast tonight, it'll be a quiet time around you and you won't be fussed too much about the other things that would normally distract you. And you can focus on your attention on what Chris has got to say to us now and perhaps it'll move us to put away the doubts and to be more confident followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, I don't know how many times you've ever been walking about in the woods and suddenly hear a rum, rum, rum. Hear some chainsaw in the background <laughs> in the distance or something. You think, wow, that sounds like a lot of power. Or you, you're standing by a, a tractor and you hear the turbos kick in. <laughs> you hear the engine roll. <laughs> and it just reminds you of that power um, that some of these things have. Um, but today we're going to talk about a different kind of power that isn't so um, o obvious. Uh, at when you first start it and what meets the eye initially. So we're going to talk about the power in silence. The power in silence. <laughs> and just some interesting facts. So when you think about power you do think about these loud noises. But if you but power, there's so many different types of it. And Gravity itself is a power, and any falling object falls at 9.8 meters a second. No matter how big they are, it falls that fast to the ground. That's the kind of power that gravity has here on Earth. And even the gravitational pull that we, we see from tides that we, we get from the moon and other details that I'm not intelligent enough to know about. But there's, there's these subtle, silent powers that we can see the effects of, but we don't hear them. <laughs> um, a breaking wave, for example, is um, 1 to 29 tons per square meter. And that's just one breaking wave per square meter. So if you think about the weight of one wave yeah. and then you think about the gravity of, of what creates the tides, it shows what source of power there is that, that is moving in silence that we can't see. Even the sun itself, the sun radiates enough solar power in about 15 minutes that yeah. people use all year in all resources. We were just talking about uh, the power of the sun and how easy it is to get sunburnt just before we uh, were opening up the word here. It just shows the actual power that the, the sun has and you don't hear the sun, it's silent, but you can, you can see the effects, you can feel the effects. 
just like to first off turn to 1 Kings in chapter 19 and this is reading about Elijah and it's likely very familiar to a lot of you uh, which is good we're going to read it again together starting from the middle of verse 9 and the word of the Lord came to him what are you doing here Elijah he replied I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty the Israelites have rejected your covenant broken down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword I'm the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too the Lord said go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord for the Lord is about to pass by then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord but the Lord was not in the wind after the wind there was an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake after the earthquake came a fire but the Lord wasn't in the fire and after the fire came a gentle whisper when Elijah heard it he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave then a voice said to him what are you doing here Elijah he replied I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty the Israelites have rejected your covenant broken down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword I'm the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel king of Aram. So we think of wind as being very, very powerful. We think of earthquakes as phenomenally powerful. We think about the power and the energy that comes from fire. But that wasn't the source of power that was to be revealed to Elijah it was the power of the word of God the power of his voice speaking to him in the quiet in the silence moving moving ahead to second chronicles in chapter 20 second chronicles in chapter 20 this was when enemies were coming up against Jehoshaphat and in reading from verse 15 it says he said listen King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem this is what the Lord says to you do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army for the battle is not yours but God's tomorrow march down against them they will be climbing up by the pass of Ziv and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel you will not have to fight this battle take up your positions and stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you O Judah and Jerusalem do not be afraid, do not be discouraged go out and face tomorrow and the Lord will be with you so he was told to go and face face the battle but was he to told to do anything? no the battle was the Lord it was to go and to observe what the Lord was going to do there's often times when we feel like we need to say something, we need to do something, we need to be heard to be able to help a situation. But sometimes it's not that simple and it's not the best scenario. Sometimes it is to be silent and to let the Lord work out the justice and peace that is to be served. So, when we think about this silence and, and the power that it has in the silence, the fact that the Lord can win battles for armies like this without any of us lifting a finger, it's, it's phenomenal, it's wonderful to see the power that 
can can be expressed from God um, when we stand out of the way and let Him move move mountains, so to speak. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter fifty three. And verse 7. Once again, also very familiar to a lot of you, but I don't mind rereading any part of the scriptures. Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before his shears was silent, so he did not open his mouth. There's power in silence. It took power to be silent. It took strength to be silent. And there was power displayed through his silence. The Lord himself, he demonstrated his power in his silence and his willingness to not speak when he could have spoken. And so too when he went to the cross and he died. And darkness came over the whole land for three hours. Was it silent? It was likely quiet. And there was power displayed in his death. And then what about his resurrection? His resurrection. There was power in the silence of the grave. We sing in our PHSS sometimes. Um, in Psalm 97. And verse 4. It says, In the silent grave they lay him. Seal of stone and guard it well. Shields fetters cannot hold him. Powerless, all the hosts of hell. He comes forth, O death victorious, see him now, the risen one. Prince of life and king of glory, raised to heaven's eternal throne. Such power Desc uh, ascending from such silence from the from the grave itself from death itself he arose and we all sing hallelujah, hallelujah. <coughs> so these are very few examples but there's so many in the bible that di that display power and silence we think of daniel and the power that it must have taken to shut the lion's mouth. It wasn't Daniel that did it, but God did it. There was power displayed in that silence. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fire, there was power in the silence because there was no screaming. They had no harm. <coughs> Not even the hairs on the head were singed. And someone else was in the fire with them. There was power in the silence. How do you feel the Lord's power? I would encourage you to find it in the silence. To find it behind closed doors, on your knees before the Lord and wait on Him and feel the silence just to finish with verse um, Isaiah again um, looking at Isaiah 41 and verse 1 Be silent before me, you islands. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. Let us meet together at the place of judgment. The 
purposes regarding the helper of Israel is the title above this verse and this is God our helper for us the same God Israel is serving is the same God we serve today and it says be silent before me you islands you people you region of people that are chosen that are mine come together be silent and what will happen let the nations renew their strength find power restored find strength renewed from the silence before the Lord a lot of things you find it's better to make sure that you turn off before you plug in and <coughs> recharge and we, we can see similarity here when we're trying to recharge something it's quiet and then it's able to, once it's powered up again it's <coughs> got the strength and able to do what it was designed to do we are designed to serve and honor him in ways that is going to be profitable and pleasing to, to not just yourselves but those around you so I encourage each of you to find the strength of the Lord in the power that he has in the silence. Let us pray.